Hello and good morning. Uh, welcome to this virtual Grassy Lakes field trip with Ava and myself. We're so glad that you can come along with us today. This is going to be a, uh, a, a similar actual field trip to the real trip we're going to be doing in 2022 for the Mount Joy Carbonate Conference. And like every field trips, we will have a few stops uh, to learn more about uh, the geology between Calgary and Kenmore. And then we'll get to our section to uh, the trailhead at Grassy Lakes near Kenmore. Sounds good. Let's go on with it. Let's go. Cheers. I'm driving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly I have to come back and pick the camera up. We was going to pretend to drive off. I just can't. <laughs> it's actually... We said good morning, it's 6.15. We're tired. We're tired, it's been a long day. Great, so before we start off, here's an overview of our journey. We will have a couple of geological interest spots that we'll point out to along the way. And then there are three stops for the real event. The first is a viewpoint for Mount Yamnaska. The second is at Lac des Arcs. And the third is in Canmore to view the Three Sisters before we head along to Grassy. We're traveling straight west out of town on Highway 1A. Here we're in plains terrain, flat lying, undeformed strata, but this changes at about 20 kilometers out from the city at Jumping Pound Creek, where we transition to the foothills of the Rockies. Shallow dip in thrust sports, repeating mostly Cretaceous sands and shales. This here is the hog's bag. What we're seeing here is a slightly more resistant Brazo sandstone, which is sandwiched between the Blackstone Shale. Now, as the Blackstone Shale is older than the Brazo, this is indicating that we're at a thrust fault, which is capping the sandstone. This is a really neat example of foothills terrain here, and there are a number of examples of road cuts showing folding and thrusting along the highway. This happens to be one of my favorite because I just think it looks like a craggy part of Scotland. Okay, back on the road. We'll head northwest and then turn to the west where we'll head down back into the Bow Valley. Now this is Morley Flats. Morley Flats is a fantastic example of a drumlin field. These features were laid down some 20,000 years ago during the maximum of the Wisconsin glaciation. There are a number of teardrop shaped drumlins viewable from the road with their steeper sides facing the southwest flow of ice. They are easier to see in the other direction, so don't forget to have a look for them when we're going back home. Our first stop is at the Willow Park Campground and gives us a stellar view of Mount Laurie, more commonly known as Yamnaska. Yamnaska is a Stony Nakoda First Nation name that means flat-faced mountain, and you can certainly appreciate it from this angle. It stands at 2,240 metres above sea level and is the first mountain north of the Trans-Canada that you can see as you leave the foothills and enter the front ranges of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. It provides the first opportunity to understand the immense scale of mountain building in the Rockies. It's at the leading edge of the McConnell Thrust Sheet, which is itself one of the largest thrusts in the Rockies, extending 480 kilometres, and defines the easternmost edge of the front ranges. About 100 million years ago, the Rocky Mountains started to form during the Laramide orogeny as a result of colliding crustal plates to the west. The compressive stress caused by the collisions forced the rock to bend, forming folds and break, forming faults. Those thrust faults form when layers of rock are pushed or thrust above other layers, putting older rocks on top of younger ones. This thrust carried the Middle Cambrian Eldon limestone, which forms the 300 meter thick cliff over 40 kilometers eastward on top of the Cretaceous Belly River shales and coals, which are 65 million years old. For those of you who like to hike, you can actually walk up there yourself and place your hand directly on that thrust boundary itself. It's very, very well defined. Uh, it is a pretty strenuous hike though. Okay, now we're in the main ranges. It's time to have a look at some of these rocks. And now we head off to our second stop of the day at Lac des Arcs, which is a uh, very busy road and uh, we'll have to speak up to be heard over that traffic.
Here we are at Lac des Arcs, and Arc in French means bow. This is the location where Bow River widened to a lake. The lake was named by French naturalist Eugène Bourgeau. Why is Eva getting me to read this bit? Anyway, uh, Eugène Bourgeau in 1958. When the McConnell thrust sheet was being pushed that 32 kilometers northeastward from its original position, it didn't travel as a solid coherent block, but rather became internally deformed and compressed. This view, looking north towards the lake, illustrates how individual smaller thrust sheets are imbricated as well as compressive shortening that takes place during mountain building. The sketch of the structure and exposed Cambrian to Mississippian formations illustrates two important imbricated faults, the X-Shore and the Lac des Arcs thrusts. These are highlighted by the red dots. Uh, these are well displayed in this location and define repeats of Cambrian, Devonian and Mississippian covenants. There's a bit of a geology related industry view in here. To the west in the distance on the left side are the two Baymag magnesium oxide processing plants. They bring ore in from a mine near Radium Hot Springs and process it here. And that pretty looking quarry and plant that blends so seamlessly into its surroundings on the north side of the lake is the Lafarge Exshore cement plant and that intriguing big silver dome is quite massive. It's 111 meters diameter and 35 meters tall. Now although it looks like it should be part of a madman slayer in a Bond movie, its actual role is more mundane for dry storage of limestone. I know, dull. <laughs> The Three Sisters is a very characteristic mountain with three peaks on the south side of the Trans-Canada Highway. It's constructed of a complexly folded Devonian to Mississippian carbonate limestones. The Three Sisters occurs on the hanging wall of the Rundle Thrust, which overrides and overturns classic sediments of the Jurassic, Fernie and Kootenai groups. The Palliser group carbonate has also been tightly folded into a syncline-anticline pair in the hanging wall of the Rundle Thrust. Below the thrust, Jurassic, Fernie and Kootenai groups are deformed in the overturned Mount Allen syncline. The folded strata end against a transverse strike fault, which is uncommon in this area. Okie dokie, let's, uh, let's head off up to Grassy now. Now, just before we do, here's the uh, road ahead. Grassy Lakes Trail ascends up through a space here called White Man's Gap. And there are four main stratigraphic intervals exposed in the front ranges here at Campbell. These are the Cambrian strata, the Upper Devonian Fairhome group, the Upper Devonian Palliser formation, and a thin sliver of Mississippian Bamp formation. Through the Canmore town site, up past the Canmore Nordic Centre, uh, purchasing our ticket for the Kootenai Pass, of course, and then heading to the car park. From the car park at Glassy Lakes, it's a 1.4 kilometre hike to the lakes themselves. Pretty steep at the end there, but here we're going to have a quick look at Harling Peak. Let's take a step back and look at uh, the main stratigraphic intervals exposed in the front ranges at Kenmore. And these are the Cambrian strata at uh, the bottom here in the trees. Uh, that's overlain by the Upper Devonian Feral Home Group. And that consists of two main formations, the Cairn Formation, overlain by the South Esk Formation. And on top of that, we've got the Upper Devonian Palliser Formation that comprises the Harling Peak at the top. And there can be a thin sliver of the Mississippian Bam Formation in some cases. The succession was thrusted above Jurassic Cretaceous Siliciclastic deposits of the Kootenai Formation that are situated in the valley. The actual name of the fault that divides the Cambrian from underlying much younger Jurassic Cretaceous deposits is the Rundle Thrust, and it was part of the Laramide deformation that took place in the late Cretaceous Paleocene. So the Upper Devonian Fairholm group is the focus of the field trip. And finally, up the steep part to Grassy Lakes itself. Take it away, Ava. All right, so we are at the bottom of the section at our location, Grassy Lakes. 
Uh, it's a busy place, extremely popular, lots of people on a weekday. You'll hear lots of noise and see people walking by. Um, and certainly uh, we're really enjoying a beautiful weather and uh, nice blue skies. Correlation chart by Geltzer and Geltzer and Malamo 1993 illustrates the upper Devonian stratigraphy from uh, surface to subsurface. And if we look in the outcrop, we've got the Fellholm group, which is about 300 to 400 meters thick. And within the Fellholm group, we have the Cairn formation, and over which is right behind me. And overlying that is the South Esk Formation, which contains the Peachy, Grotto, and Arcs member. So if we're to relate that back to the subsurface, the Cairn Formation would be equivalent to the Lower Leduc, and the Peachy member of the so South Esk Formation would be the Upper Devonian Leduc. So this is a tremendous opportunity for us to assess and better understand some of the uh, differences in lithophages, reservoir properties, and geometries in reservoirs that have been producing tremendous amount of petroleum and now are becoming quite the interest for green energy initiatives such as CCUS, lithium exploration, um, and possibly even geothermal as well. Now, um, let's have a look at the Cairn Formation. Um, there are three major lithophages that we can see. Uh, the bulbous stromatoporoid, floatstone and rutstones that are forming these extensive bioherms and the patch reefs, the biostromes that we'll see examples of uh, behind as well. Uh, then we can also recognize the flanking dendritic amphipora floatstones that um, are being deposited on the flanks of some of these bulbous strong patch reefs, uh, but also they can form these extensive uh, medium bedded uh, units uh, that we'll see behind us uh, as well in a moment. Uh, the bulbous patch reefs tend to be more massive bedded, the amphipora floatstones tend to be more medium bedded. And then as we move up, shallowing up into our sequence, we see these um, cryptoalgal um, stromatolytic uh, thinly bedded dolostones. And so to see the complete sequence of these shallowing upward cycle is, is not often easy um, and we'll try today, but that's pretty typical. Also in the subsurface, we might um, you know, go from, from one to the next, but not always see the complete sequence of these uh, shallowing upward cycles. And in some cases, we might find these subaerial exposure surfaces that will def define the top of these, um, of these cycles. So um, that's all I will say for now. And we'll be going closer to look at some of the details of the textures and the, the facies that I just uh, mentioned. All right, before we go to the rocks, one more thing. Let's travel through time and go back on Earth during the Devonian era. We had a large landmass comprised of North America and Europe called Eura America, merged together to the northeast and south of where Alberta is today. The province of Alberta, including at Grassy Lakes, sat about five degrees south of the Paleo Equator. And back in the upper Devonian area, this location was covered in tropical and subtropical marine waters in which stromatoporoid and coral reef could flourish. The predominant wind direction was from the northeast. This is a palispatically restored Upper Cairn paleogeographic map modified after Milamo 1995. It highlights that the Cairn formation at Grassy Lakes occurs near the leeward edge of a stromatoporoid dominated platform margin. Now, to put things in perspective, notice the equivalent Perdri basinal shales in brown to the southwest. And then moving up section, the palispatically restored Peachy paleogeographic map, same again modified after Milamo 95, shows a significant shift of depositional environment to platform interior setting in the Peachy compared to the stromatoporoid dominated platform margin of the underlying Cairn formation. Now the basinal setting from the uppermost Perdri and Mohawk formations are now located further to the southwest 
as illustrated by the brownish color. This is a panoramic view of the Cairn Formation from the upper grassy lake, and it's showing the major depositional units here on the sketch by Burroughs and VC from number two at the bottom all the way up to eight at the top. And what you have is a series of alternating uh, units that are more laminated and represent more the restricted um, shelf and part of the coral uh, amphipora biogenic bank facies, those would be units two and eight. And then in between, you've got this alternation of more massive beds, units three through sevens that contain abundant but restricted fauna consisting mostly of these uh, branching and bulbous dromatoporoids, tabulate corals, and, and rarely uh, scattered brachiopods and gastropods. And notice the dark gray color that's so characteristic of the Cairn formation. It's this dolomitic, uh, completely dolomitized section, 160 meters thick. And you also see these uh, mounds that are very rich in bulbous dromatoporoids, and these mounds and biostromes and bioherm can vary in lateral extent uh, and they can um, be seen they're very characteristic of grassy lake section but they can be traced all the way to the spray lakes road section northward across the mountain side and you can see the geometry and how unique it is to see this in outcrop and important when you relate it back to what we see in the subsurface. So we see a lot of these leech bulbous stromatoporoids that creates large vugs on the outcrop, surrounded by light gray dolomite ghosts of the original stromatoporoid structure, and a spectacular contrast to the almost black, dark gray dolomitic matrix. And so this is a great example of vuggy dolostone, an excellent reservoir that's so um, common in the uh, Leduc in the subsurface um, that we see here in Alberta and that's made such a great producer for you know all these decades in uh, our basin in western Canada. Thank you Ava. As we move up the canyon along the face of the canyon we can view many of the details that Ava just spoke to. Heading out of the upper lake into the climber zone, we're now entering a rockfall hazard area, so please use some caution. Now on the other side of the canyon is a platform that is used by the climbing school, which practices on this exceptionally clean face of the cairn. On this face, there is a lower, orderly, restricted facies of several meters with these flat, obate shaped bugs that are restricted to particular layers that form almost parallel bands along the face. It's, it's quite extraordinary. That's in contrast to a more chaotic looking, more open marine setting that is on top of this. Now I'm gonna chat about this stuff in a minute, uh, but as we make our way up, I'm gonna ponder why any type of person would ever put themselves in such a perilous position as this. And I think climbing is mental. All right, so we're moving up the section, grassy lakes up into, into the Cairn Formation. And I want to highlight that this whole feral home group has been extensively dolomitized. And through that process, uh, there's a lot of destruction, destruction of the primary fabric. So it's not always easy to identify some of the primary textures and uh, to unravel the whole depositional history. But we can see uh, some changes, such as at this location, for example, looking at the bedding. Um, so we have this massive, finely laminated unit overlain by a massive vuggy unit. Um, and if we take a closer look, it's not easy to see because it's fully dolomitized. Uh, possibly uh, some of this finely laminated could be uh, cryptalgal, stromatolytic uh, type textures. Uh, so uh, shallower setting intertidal. And the unit above, which is this vuggy, massive, uh, full of bulbous stromatoporoid floatstone to rotstone, could be your next shallowing upward cycle. Um, so certainly we do see changes, but it's not always clear to go back to the primary uh, textures. All 
All right, we're about halfway up uh, the hill here, out of breath getting here, certainly. And we're still in the cairn formation. And what I wanted to show you here was just these lovely rows after rows of uh, horizontally, well, originally horizontally bedded uh, vuggy networks that we have in this formation here. So let's talk about the vugs themselves. The vugs are there because of solution enhancement. Undersaturated fluids have passed through this rock throughout its geological history and dissolved out uh, the surfaces of existing pore spaces. Maybe those pore spaces were dissolved out fossils, as many th different things they could be, and now they're these amorphous vugs. So we, while we can see these go through, what they really do show is that a lot of fluid has passed through them. And that tells us something about the nature of plumbing within carbonate rocks we see a huge amount of fluid has to pass through this system to create this vuggy network. And you know what? It may well still be there. So we could see very easily that large scales, kilometers, even hundreds of kilometers wide, that this system of permeability that we see right here in front of us can be the element of communication far and wide throughout a reservoir. So you inject in one spot and you see the pressure in another spot kilometers away uh, within the space of a few weeks or a month. You know, really has that type of, of connection between these spots here, which we need to understand when we're looking at these reservoirs. We're here at the contact um, with these lamina um, algal laminates, I think, dolomitized, overlain by a vuggy bioherm on top. So, as we get this right, so right here is our bioherm, and the contact for that, if you want to point that out there, mm -hmm. right uh, pretty there. much right there. So this surface, uh, maybe oh, out. Look, there's mud cracks. Oh, maybe there is evidence of original mud cracks there. So this would have been a subaerially exposed surface for a period before that bioherm rooted itself here. So that that's not just a crack that happens to have happened now. That's actually occurring along a darker trace, which is the mud, right? Yeah. Well, and it has a bit of an orthogonal um, shape to it here. So mm -hmm. I think it's um, illustrating some primary type fabric. Perfect. Okay. And let's just pull back here and have a quick look at this stuff that we're so now we've gone up and this is our bioherm. So here again is this uh, biostrome and uh, it's characterized with these large, just uh, dissolved out bulbous stromatoporoids. You can see those all over the place. That's what makes those big holes. Um, but when you get your eye in, you can also see some smaller features like this here, like there. These are probably dissolved out uh, corals and then smaller still, you get right underneath there. These are amphipora. Look at all those. Um, and then again, more evidence of um, these corals just in there. And if we pull down again, a nice little thicket down here of amphipora once more. You can see some of these lines there. And if you look a bit more, we've seen some other little uh, features. Some maybe brachiopods. This is a bit more of a isolated rock here. Probably not in place, but it gives you a lovely cross section of all of these um, biota in here. I think that's Thamnopora, I would say. A coral. In between with some Amphipora. Good Devonian stuff. All right, so we saw these um, cryptalgal dolmatized 
stromatolytic dolomite stone overlain by this big massive um, biostrom or patch reef right on top um, and this is just a different perspective and we're moving up the section now and on top of this biostrom we have a lighter gray colored uh, section which um, when we look at uh, the diagrams in the paper by Burroughs, the guidebook, uh, is about where the contact between the Cairn Formation and the South Esk Formation is located. And it's actually um, pretty abrupt or pretty sharp, and we'll show you some close-up in a moment. But in the literature, in some cases, the contact between the lower Leduc in the subsurface and the middle or the upper Leduc is not always sharp and easy to delineate. Um, and certainly here today, it's, it's looking like we can sort of see the change and the color is abrupt enough to be able to delineate it uh, and recognize it. Now pulling back to get the same view as the sketch from Burroughs, we can see our path so far up into the Peachy member. And it would be remiss of me not to point out the famous rock paintings that we can see on the way. The Peachy Member marks a significant shift of deposition environments from the stromatoporoid dominated platform margin of the Cairn Formation to the platform interior. The interior being restricted from open marine conditions by the margin was characterised by medium to thinly bedded shallow lagoon deposits rich in amphipora and peritidal stromatolites. As we move further up the canyon, we come to the grotto member which overlies the peachy via an unconformity that reportedly has caliche deposits, though all we actually found was frat boy climbers, so we didn't stay long. The final stop of this trip is up the last uphill stretch to reach the arcs member. At the top, you'll reach Spray Lakes and realise that it might have been a much easier trip if we had parked up there instead of doing this gruelling hike on what is a really hot summer's day. Sorry about that. All right, so we're at the very top of the section in the Arcs member of the South Esk Formation. You can see the outcrop behind me. And uh, it's a very interesting area because we're losing the bulbous stromatoporoids we're losing the amphiporas, and instead we're getting um, an abundance of these uh, uh, megalodont and gastropods, uh, some uh, stromatactus uh, textures as well, poorly preserved because of dolomitization. Um, and as you can see, it's very dusty and it's, it's not a nice place to stay too, too long. Okay, Eva, can you tell us about megalodonts? What do they signify? Well, it's a change um, in the uh, depositional environment, uh, if you read the paper by Iliak, 1998, uh, where he documents them in various locations in the Devonian um, of Western Canada, but also elsewhere in Canada. And uh, basically the possibility here to explain the occurrence of these megalodont and gastropods and the absence of these trematoporoids and corals, it could have been uh, nutrient upwelling, which uh, bivalves and um, heterozoans like gastropods and um, other of these creatures will be way more tolerant of a change in turbidity or a change in uh, amounts of nutrients uh, which would tend to um, shut down the production or the uh, type of environment that is friendly for corals and, and stromatoporoids and um, types of biotas that we saw earlier in the uh, lower part of the section. Okay, and this is a fairly dangerous corner, so we're going to uh, cut right here. All right, that wraps it up, everybody. We're back down at the main lakes. We're going home. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you back at the Mount Joy 2022 in person so we can hike this trail together and actually put our hands on the rocks and uh, have some exchanges and discussions with you. 
and a very big, big thanks to all the people that have been so generous who've done this field trip before and that have given us their information and give us little tips about where to look and where to see some really cool stuff. We'll have a, a reference list of all of those folks right at the end of this. Thank you to them, thank you to you, and see you this time next year.